you've landed inside Launch Street, the business innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate, differentiate, and get further, faster. Since you're here, we know you're the type of person that recognizes the importance of unlocking your innovation advantage so you can compete and win. And now, your host, the person that has worked with leading companies like Disney, Procter & Gamble, Aero Electronics, the U.S. Army Research Labs, and Red Robin on upping their innovation advantage, Tamara Gontor. Hey, Launch Street, Tamara here, your host. I am super excited for today's podcast. Um, I love all of our podcasts that we release because, you know, we only release the best. But today's I'm particularly excited about because we are adding a new format to our podcast where we answer your questions. So your challenges, your hurdles, your roadblocks, and actually hopefully some of your best practices as well. So if you haven't seen the myriad of announcements out there, all you have to do is go to launchstreet.com. So go to our website, gotolaunchstreet.com, and click on the button that says record and record your question for us. That's it. That's all you got to do. And then all of us get to benefit from that. Now, here's the thing I want us all to remember. And I know I've said it before in my emails too. I'm sure I sound like a broken record, but it's so true. All of us benefit from one of us asking and sharing. If you are dealing with a hurdle or roadblock, just, you know, a situation that you're like, hey, I need to think, I need some help, I need some advice about how I can be more innovative, my team, all of that. In you asking that question, I guarantee you somebody else has that same challenge out there. Many of us probably have that same challenge out there. So not only are you not alone, but by you being brave enough to ask the question, to submit it, all of us get to benefit from that. So I hope that you will take the time and click on the button and ask your one minute question. That's all it takes. And all of us on Law Street get smarter, more innovative. We go further faster together. And hey, by the way, if you have a best practice that you'd like to share, something that you tried and implemented, that's awesome too. I think we all benefit from that too. And you submitting that can be a great springboard to the podcast and to conversation. So it doesn't have to be a question or challenge. It can also be a, hey, I did this with my team and it worked. And that'll give us an opportunity to talk about why it worked, how to implement that, how to keep that momentum going. But like I said, you got to ask the question, you got to click the button. So go to our website and make that happen. All right. I think you're going to like our opening question. So let's go to Tracy, see what she has to ask. Hey, Tamara, I worked at one of the largest salty snack producers in the country. They always wanted us to go outside the box, come with all sorts of ideas, make everything better. And every one of my ideas, every one of everyone's ideas, the answer was always no. So this expectation for innovation was there and we just weren't allowed to do it. How can I work around that? First, let's all give Tracy a round of applause for being the first person to click the button and ask a question. We got plenty in and I'm excited to keep doing this, but Tracy was the first and I wanna honor that and recognize her for being willing to just so quickly hit record and ask a question that she knows she's gonna benefit from the answer, but so are all of us on Launch Street. Thank you, Tracy. All right, I wanna, I wanna dig into this in so many different ways. Um, I'm gonna answer this from kind of two different perspectives. One is the external perspective, meaning the environment and the culture that she's in. And the second one is from the internal perspective, meaning what she, Tracy, and all of us can do better when we are trying to get buy-in for our ideas, when we're trying to communicate innovation. And, you know, I want to kind of address what she also talked about in the, like, that she was saying, and I, and I think a lot of us have dealt with this, that, you know, they kept telling her and, and everybody on the team to go outside the box. We want innovation outside the box. But yet, every time they brought something, it was shut down. So as she said, there's this expectation for innovation, but the reality is that innovation is not happening. And I think a lot of us have been in that situation in our teams where, you know, the leadership from whatever level you're in, but someone else, you know, kind of up above says, 
hey, we want more innovation, we want more innovation, go outside the box, but it ultimately feels like lip service. And, you know, it's like kind of the flavor of the month, something that people should say in leadership, but they don't really want or know what to do with or even how to do it, frankly. I've seen that all the time. Um, and I think the second part to that is actually it, it, in doing that and having that expectation, but not actually accepting it and making it happen, there's actually a, a bigger issue, which I think actually does more damage, and that is it demoralizes people and keeps them from wanting to bring more innovation. It shuts people down. So when you tell people, I want this from you, but then you don't actually allow it to happen, the ultimate result of that is people actually shutting down and driving themselves into a more status quo, just get it done mindset because their ideas or their innovation isn't rewarded. And by the way, I don't necessarily mean rewarded like it's always implemented. Not every idea is a good one. Not every idea is right. Not every idea is fully thought out. By rewarded, what I really mean is heard and valued. What I have found in my years of experience is that people don't need to be right. They need to be heard. They need to be valued. And when we shut people down, we're saying we don't value your thinking. We don't value your ideas. And that is the situation Tracy's in. So as I said, let me go and address it from the two places I want to, the external and the internal, the external being the environment. So um, I often talk about this and I just wrote about it in my upcoming book. You know, there's really three things that keep us from innovating, um, fear, comfort, and constraint. So fear and comfort can be internal and external, but the constraint is that external side. It's the constraints of the system that I was just talking about. Leadership always shuts it down. The processes actually hinder innovation. Um, everything becomes analysis paralysis. Um, everything is a no and, and rationalized away is not an innovation to pursue or an idea to pursue. You know, uh, years ago, I was working at this brand strategy and innovation firm, and I had this boss. She was so petite. But man, was she, she just had this love of hierarchy and a love of systems and kind of what was proven and tried and true, which is kind of ironic given we worked in branding and innovation. But she was very smart. Actually, she was brilliant, but very into this is how things are done. And she would shut us down time and time again if we would come up with something that hadn't been seen before or would maybe be a new way of tackling a challenge or something that, you know, had no kind of proven track record in her mind of success. And those constraints of that system, because she was our leader and she was our bottleneck, we couldn't get it done without her approval, made it so that none of us wanted to innovate which is kind of what Tracy's experience. So there's a lot of reality to the system working against you. And if you're one of the people in the system, I would encourage you to really think about how you can remove some of those constraints. Now, here's the reality that none of us in innovation want to talk about. No matter what company you're in, there are constraints that are not going to go away right away. We have to pick and choose our battles. We can't minimize or get rid of every single constraint right out of the gate. All you'll do in that case, all you'll do in that case is actually bump up against the biggest brick wall you have ever experienced. You'll just fall down bruised. It's not going to work. So out of the gate, when dealing with those constraints, we want to think about what are the ones that we could potentially get rid of now? What are the ones that we could work around, maybe not get rid of, maybe even just work around them now? When I used to work for this boss and I realized, hey, she just is going to always shut us down. It's nothing that's going to happen. What I started to actually do is when we were in all team meetings where everybody was involved, um, I would start to pepper those ideas there because the CEO was there. The chief marketing officer was there. People from other teams were there so that I wasn't bottlenecked by her because in every other scenario, the rest of the time, we were working with her directly and she was kind of our, our gatekeeper. So I found those moments where she wasn't the only one in the room who had, um, who had the ability to make change happen. And that slowly chipped away and got us more and more room. Now, I'm not saying go around people and over people, although maybe I am. Maybe sometimes you frankly just have to do that. But what I am saying is look at those constraints in your system and figure out where, where you can start. Where are some low-hanging fruit that you can actually remove some of those constraints and get a little bit more traction and a little bit more traction for yourself and for your team. And by the way, if you're in leadership at any level, I think that's your job. I think as leaders, it is upon us to remove the constraints so that our team can innovate, period. It's not our, always our job to come up with the innovation. 
It's our job to make sure that they have what they need and that is removing constraints. So the second part, and actually, you know what, before I go on, there's another part I wanna say when it comes to constraints and when you often are battling a no, because here's the thing about no. I like to see it as a suggestion. Sometimes it's set in stone, but sometimes it's because instead of telling the idea to someone, we need to prove it to them. We need to show it to them. Sometimes it's hard for people on the other side of the table to actually see the brilliance without experiencing the results. So in order to see the brilliance, they need to experience some of the results. I'm not saying go launch the product or change your internal system out of the gate. I'm just saying, is there a small way that you can show those people who are the constraints, the holders of the constraints, why your idea is gonna work? Sometimes you get more traction that way. And that kind of leads into the second part of this, which is, how, this is the internal side. So how do you communicate those ideas in a way that's actually going to get you buy-in, in a way that's actually going to get you some momentum. Here's something that we all suffer from. And I heard it in Tracy's question. I hear it all the time. I think we suffer from something called they syndrome, T-H-E-Y, they syndrome. They don't get it. They keep saying no. They think it'll never work, right? They're not brilliant. They're not seeing the brilliance. This is where I think a little bit of my tougher side comes in a little bit of tough love. The thing that we need to realize as the owners of that innovation is that it's not, they are not the problem. We're the problem. We need to communicate in a way that gets buy-in. We need to communicate in a way that, that starts to chip away at those constraints. We need to communicate in a way that gets the people on the other side of the table to start to come along for the journey with us. I'm not saying that that guarantees buy-in, but I am saying that guarantees you at least a conversation and not a no out of the gate. Because here's the thing I'd like you to consider. When those people on the other side of the table hear new idea, what do you think they really hear? It's not the brilliance of your idea. Our little lizard brains, our primal minds, here's what they hear. Oh my gosh. That idea that Tamara just said out loud, all that is is more work for me. Oh, is this going to change how I do things? If we implement this, how much energy am I going to have to expend to figure it out? Our primal brain wants to keep us comfortable, safe. And sometimes, even from the most innovative people, when presented with a new idea, what they hear is all the things that are going to make them unsafe. It's going to make them expend energy. That's going to make them change. So we got to think about how do we flip the language on them so that, that what they hear is opportunity, potential, recognition for having a new idea. But that's not what they hear out of the gate. So if we want to change our outcomes and get past those no, Tracy, we got to change our language. I say this from the stage all the time, change your language, change your outcomes. The reality is the ideas no longer live on their own. I mean, how many times have you been in a meeting where you've said something that you thought, ta-da, here's the solution. It's freaking brilliant. Don't you see it? And the people on the other side of the table are just giving you that Scooby-Doo, huh? Kind of look. That's my best Scooby-Doo impression, by the way. <laughs> That's because what they're hearing isn't the brilliance of the idea. They're hearing, oh, more work, oh, changes how I do stuff. Oh, this means I'm gonna have to expend more energy. So we gotta change how we do that so that we flip it on them. Here's the other thing I've come to realize. As much as people want innovation, well, here's what they don't want. They don't want people pushing their brilliance onto them. So if we wanna have an idea that gets past no, we gotta get them to feel like their brilliance is also included. Now, I'm not saying that everybody, it's not consensus. Not everybody has to be involved all the time. But think about the last time you were in a meeting. And let's say you're presenting an idea to your team, whether that's leadership or the team that works for you. And you say to them, here's my idea. What do you think? Right? Or here's my PowerPoint presentation. Let's go through all the data. That's not enough. All that person on the other side of the table hears is everything I just said about change and energy and all that. And... Now they're being pushed upon. We're pushing our innovation onto them. So in situations, Tracy, where, I'm where we're constantly getting no's, 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 the first thing I look at 
aside from the constraints of the system that we can chip away out, I think that's very important, is also, well, how do I get them to feel included in this conversation? How do I say things like, here's the idea, what would you do to make it stronger? Let them tell you. First of all, it's arrogant to think that we have all the answers. Let them tell you. What does this idea need to include to be workable for you? What does this idea need to have to, to get to the next stage? Let them tell you. They're your gatekeepers. You need them. I think uh, oftentimes the mistake that we make is we take our thinking and we present it to the world like it's final. But in the early stages, it's not final. That innovation needs massaging. It needs molding. I think of it as like wet clay on that spinning table thing, whatever it's called. It's not called a spinning wheel, is it? I don't know. You know what I mean? Where you make pottery out of clay. But we make the mistake, because we've been thinking about it for so long, of putting it out in the world like it is final. And when we do that, we're forcing people to either love it or hate it versus be involved with it and make it stronger and mold it with us. So I say we need to get our egos out of the way, get over the they syndrome, and let other people be involved. And this works at any level. I don't care if you are a part-time cashier at a restaurant in the mall or you know, a vice president, blah, 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 with a bunch of um, you know, adjectives behind your title. The truth is, if you wanna get buy-in for your ideas, if you wanna get past no, we gotta get people to feel like they're a part of the conversation. We gotta get over the they syndrome and over the ego. Think of our ideas as wet clay and present them in that way. You know, sometimes, um, you know, if it's not fully thought out, for me, what I'll say to my team is, hey guys, I have this idea, it's just wet clay at this stage, but I'd love to get your perspective. And I'll tell you, there's something really powerful in that language because it takes people's guards way down because instead of them kind of gearing up for, oh my gosh, she's gonna push my brilliant, her brilliance onto me, this is gonna be change for me and energy for me, suddenly they're like, oh, this is just a nugget of a thought that Tamara is working through and I'm just gonna brainstorm with her for a second. So, and I mean it, by the way, I'm not being manipulative. I really mean, hey, this idea is wet clay. It's just a nugget. I need your thinking on it. But in doing that, I also tend to get more momentum and more buy-in because I'm giving them permission to be involved in the idea. And I'm presenting the idea in a way that shows that it is not complete, that I'm not looking for a yes or no. I'm looking to get it to the next stage. And I don't know about you, but I'd much rather get my ideas to the next stage versus get it to a yes or a no. I don't want a fork in the road when I'm trying to move innovation forward. What I want is a rope. I want someone to help me climb up that mountain and get to the next platform, the next level. By the way, that visual in my head totally worked. So I hope it works on the podcast, but I think you get the point. So to recap a little bit, um, there's internal and there's external. From the external perspective, it's the constraints. And I would like you to think about how can I, well, I'd like you to think about what are all the constraints and then how can I chip away at them in a way that's actually doable without getting massively shut down, right? One little thing at a time. What are the ones that I could tackle right now and remove and then get bigger and bigger and bigger? Because as we all know, if you try to tackle all the constraints all at once, it becomes a cluster. Nobody wants to help you with that. And frankly, leadership says no, because that means massive work. So find the constraint, the, the constraints that you can actually tackle and then get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the second one is, from the internal perspective is we got to get rid of the they syndrome and get rid of the ego. And we've got to communicate our ideas in a way that helps people get on board for the journey so that it's not being presented as change and energy, but as, hey, here's something that I want to bring you in on. Hey, let's bring our brilliance together. Hey, let's, let's look at this wet clay and figure out how to mold it. And there was a third thing in there I talked a little bit about between the transition, which was the prove, don't tell. Um, sometimes you just got to show the value of an idea. And that means getting it off paper and doing a little bit of an experiment and then showing the results of that experiment. All right, Tracy, once again, thank you for asking. Long Street, I so appreciate you. Please send in your questions. Please send in your comments. I so love to hear them. Um, and I really look forward to hearing about how you've removed some constraints and changed your language to change your outcomes. 
Thanks for hanging with us on Inside Lawn Street. If you know someone that is truly ready to unlock their innovation advantage, have them join you on Lawn Street. Discover your innovation advantage. Build a team of high-performing innovators and ignite ideas and solutions that create massive impact. G-O-T-O, LaunchStreet.com. Remember, innovators, if you don't take the leap, somebody else will.